Okay, this is day three with my rental violin. I'm gonna run through some things that I have speed learned in the past couple of days. One is that you, you don't have to use a shoulder rest. Um, I found it really awkward. I actually liked it better without, but um, you want it kind of angled like across this way instead of like perched on your shoulder. And you want the violin to be more or less parallel to the ground. And when you put your chin on it, it's going kind of like this and your nose is pointed sort of along the line of the violin. You want to be able to take your hand off of it completely and still have a firm grip. So I probably have some more adjustments to do, but um, that's the basics of it. Your hand, you want to rest the violin like right in the nook. And if you press it like all the way against the back, you get sort of a, a good hand position here because you want this to be straight. And then your fingers you want to cup over. And like with cup your hands, all of the fingers are on the same level. So you're doing sort of a, a cupping with your hand, almost like a C. That goes right there and it's a little hard to bend your <laughs> bend your hands I'm finding out I'm gonna need some time with that but you're definitely rotating your wrist so you need rotate cup and right now that feels like a strain to me but I'm sure it will even out in time I just have to get more flexibility okay so the first thing you're going to need to do with your violin is learn how to tune it. If you have a piano, that's a little bit easier. But essentially, you always start tuning with this string here. It's the second in from the right. The right being the very thinnest one, which is E. So you do A first, then the one to the left of it, which is D. And then you do G, which is the thickest and lowest. And then you pack, pop back over to E. And while you're tuning it, sometimes things can go a little out of tune. So you always want to go back to A, which is this one right here. And keep trying it. These are your knobs. These are what you use initially to move the note up and down significantly. And then when you're very close, you use the fine tuners here, these four little knobs. And when you turn it to the right, it'll tighten it up. It will bring the pitch up. So like A to A sharp or A sharp down to A. That would be loosening it would bring it down. This right here is your bridge. This is not attached to the violin. So if you ever have um, loose strings or strings that pop off you need the strings tight on there to hold it in place or else it'll just go and fall off so usually you don't have to worry about it just don't loosen all the strings at one time like don't take them all off to repair them do it one at a time and you'll be fine the tricky thing about trying to make notes on the violin is Unlike guitar, there's there's no frets. I have these indications marked right here, but I had to do that by hand. It's just tape. So I will get to that in case you saw that and thought about guitar. It's not actually part of the violin. Okay, so if you're going to tune, you want to hold it like this and just strum the note with your hand between the fingerboard and the bridge. That's the playable area, and it's also where you would um, use the bow or just strum it to get a good note. So I'll strum it and listen, and you can either use a phone app like Digital Tuner Lite or something of that nature, or the notes actually correspond to notes on the piano. So A. is A4, D is 
actually D4. So that's in the same little part of the piano. Now G goes down an octave and G is G3. And then E is E5. Okay, this is already tuned because I took time tuning it. So if you're using a piano, you can kind of go by your ear or if you have a tuner or a dedicated tuner, not an app, then this will kind of show you when you go like a little flat or a little sharp and you can adjust the knobs and then the fine tuners. When you do the knobs though, you want to turn towards you to loosen it a little bit. Like you pluck the string and then you'd loosen it and you'd hear the tone drop, but then you will go and tighten it and listen for it to be close to the note that you want. This is to do the big adjustments. And the reason that you loosen it first is because if your knob sticks, you could have an issue where you crank it too hard, you over tighten it and you pop a string. So that's gonna be time and money and possibly um, losing time to play. So just don't do that. Just always loosen it first, that way you reduce risk and then go ahead and tighten it. And you wanna push in a little bit as you tighten it because that way it'll, it'll stay more secure in the peg box so it doesn't slip. Then when you get it close to the note, you're just gonna use these little fine tuner adjustments down here. And what they do is they're, um, they're almost like a screw and there is a limit to how far you can crank them down. So keep that in mind if you get to the end of a fine tuner adjustment and you can't go any further and you need it to go further, go ahead and loosen it back up and do more adjustment on the knobs. You can see where the string goes to, like the E, you can trace it back to this knob. The A, you can trace it back to this knob up here. And then the D is this one, and then this is the G but you can see it very clearly in the box here. You just have to look and know what you're looking for. Okay, so I went over rosin in a previous video, but it's very important, so I'm gonna go over it again. This is a little cheap cake of rosin, and you see the surface is kind of scratched up and that end is like really shiny. When you first get it, the whole thing is shiny like that, like glycerin soap. And you can try and put it on your bow all you want. However, you might not have it work very well because it's it's like um, laminate almost. It's like plastic, it just doesn't do much. So what you wanna do is take um, like a sharp knife or something and then you're gonna scratch the surface until you get a powdery substance off the rosin and that's actually what's going on to the bow. So when you get to that point, put your thumb up over this little metal piece right above the frog. The frog is, is this part and they call it a frog and they call this the mouth. That is where your thumb ends up going. But you're gonna go ahead and put your thumb over that because if you are putting the rosin on, you can hit your thumb, you're not gonna hit the rosin cake upon that metal bit because it will crack and you don't want that. So you just go like this and rosin up the bow. It usually takes a lot of rosin to get going when it's brand new. And how you test it is if it doesn't really make a noise on the violin, you absolutely need more rosin. If it's still squeaky and stuff, you need more rosin. And there is such a thing as too much rosin, but you don't really have to worry about that when a bow is new because it takes a while to, to get it nice and rosined up. So bow hold comes just after learning about tightening it. Okay, so when you get a bow, it's going to be kind of like loose and floppy like this. Generally it's horsehair. 
see how it's all loose and floppy. I'm waiting for this to focus. Oh, you get the idea. It's, it's loose and floppy. And this is how you adjust it. There's this little knob and you're going to turn it clockwise and it's going to tighten up the hairs. You can see them sort of coming into alignment there. And what you're going to aim for is you're going to have a bigger gap on the ends, on both ends since the bow is curved. And you do not want to lose that curve. You want to keep um, a slight U-shaped curve there. And as you tighten it, the space between the actual stick part and the hair is going to start to widen. And if it widens too much, this bow will lose its curve. It'll go more like straight, or even in extreme cases, it'll go like this. And you don't want that. So you're going to aim for about a pinky's width in the middle and then the ends you'll see are more than that and do not touch the hairs if you do that you'll end up making your bow not be as good it won't take the rosin well in those areas and that will create awful sounds okay after practice you're going to re-loosen it and that helps keep the bow um, nice and supple it's not going to over flex the hairs and get them they wear out almost like elastic if you're not careful so that's why when you put it in your case you want to go ahead and make it loose again and you know get all that proper so I'm going to tuck my thumb in there and the fingers curve around and the pinky actually sits on top So you'll probably have to get used to the, um, the angle a little bit. So they call these open strings when you don't have any fingers down. So again you have G, then D, then A, then E. So that was G and you play it with your bow pretty much level like this. And that's what happens when you don't have enough speed or pressure, you get those like So if you have a squeaky violin, that's probably your problem. Again, speed and pressure. And you should feel the string kind of vibrate. So putting one finger down, it's about an inch from where the strings kind of go over this bit here called the nut into the box there. Be A. B. C. Now here's my problem. I can't quite make my pinky hit that next part. Um, when I go to violin lesson next week, that's the first thing I'm going to ask about. Um, it's going to be hand position and working on dexterity, I'm sure. But at least I've got part of the notes and that's what counts. I wanted to go back into how and why I have these little tape marks here. So, like I said, the guitar doesn't have um, this issue because it has those metal frets and it tells you where to put your fingers. It's a guide. You might put your finger like between uh, two metal frets and you can visually see and you can feel where your hand is. But violin is more difficult because you have to learn it by feel. But this helps when you're a beginner because you can at least look and see where the tape is. And you can get those guides where it has like a bunch of like little individual stickers and it tells you what the name of the notes is and everything but that can actually backfire and limit you as a student because you get used to reading it instead of getting the feel and 
getting used to listening um, to the note. Like if you hit this, and you're like, okay, well that's a G, but then you play this, you're like, no, that's, that's not right. So you, you would slide your finger up or down to find the right note. So you kind of have to develop your ear. Okay. So generally, when you're moving your fingers down the violin towards yourself, this way, towards the base of the instrument, you're actually going up in pitch. So open string is G, the next one is A, so that would be like B, C. So you're traveling up, you're going up in sound. And likewise, when you move towards the end of the instrument, towards the scroll or the head of the instrument, you're going back down. This is something that's really cool, but G, A, B, C, D, then your string is the E, and then you go down the next string. Then you do the open string, and then you have notes that are down the string. So it's, it's almost like reading in a book, where you know you read left to right, and up and down, and on violin, you read down, and then you jump over, and then you go down, and then you jump over, and then you go down, and jump over, and then you go down. So the main notes are these open strings, and the notes that you'll play on these lines here, and between that is actually your flats and your sharps. So I'm gonna show you a page of my notebook if it will let me focus. Hopefully it will. Okay, so you see that little diagram there? This is the open strings right here. And these right here are showing you the flats and the sharps. And the ones in bright yellow. Moose has been trying to eat the bow, like he's jaws or something. And see, he's, he's ready. He's ready to do stuff. Okay, so yeah, this is just um, to keep in mind that in between those, those tape lines, those major areas, you'll have your more fancy stuff like flats and sharps. And there are actually duplicates of some of the note letters, just to keep in mind. I'm gonna show you one more thing here because this has to do with putting the tape down. Okay, you see this little diagram here? You're actually using those measurements, and this would be on the centimeter um, side of a roller, but you're actually measuring um, about 35 millimeters approximately, and then 66, and then 80, and then 106, and then you're marking a little line in uh, pencil, and then you're putting the little strip of tape down there. Now some people use electrical tape or other kind of tapes. I used artist tape because one, I had it, and two, it's easy to pull it back up off of surfaces without leaving a residue. And what else I wrote right here is actually, you can just measure from like this point to this point is 35 millimeters. And then this point to this point I'm sorry, 35, and then this point to this point is 31, and then this point to this point is 14, it's closer, and then the last one is about 26. So if you just wanna measure like from each line, like measure that and then do your next measurement from here to here, it's a little less counting. And then, um, yeah, just the, the tape I used was uh, the thin artist tape, so it's about like, like this, and I split it so it's very fine. It's half the width of the tape. So if you can see this here, this end of the fingerboard, you see that little indent right there, like a lip? That is where you want to measure from. So from that end to the middle of where that tape is, that was like the first measurement of 35 centimeter, 35 millimeters. And then the next one, I just measured from here to here. And then you see this one is close together. That actually is for a very good reason. Being that I have studied some piano now, I get this, but 
when you are doing notes on the piano, you don't have the black keys, which are the, the sharps and flats. So if you go from say G to A, is a whole step. And then G to G sharp is called a half step. So that utilizes the black keys. And when you go from open string G to A, that's a whole step. And then A to B is also a whole step. But when you look on the piano, there's actually no black key between B and C. So that's why this is closer together. It's like a whole step. Um, there's no black key, there's no B sharp, it just goes B to C. And then this one right here, this would be C to D, and there is a black key, there is a C sharp. So it gets a little complicated with why there's no sharps, um, piano stuff, this is about violin, so just know this is for a reason. Whole step, half step, whole step. Okay, and then the last thing, these are actually metal strings. It's also possible to have composite, synthetic, or um, natural fiber. So there's three different types of strings that you can get. And the metal ones are known to be longer lasting. However, they lose their tune kind of quickly until they break in. The good thing is, for a student, they're longer lasting, but they take longer to break in. Sometimes two weeks of, you know, fairly regular playing, and then they'll hold their tune better. Um, the only other thing I didn't really cover is instrument costs and what you're actually paying for. So, this was the cheapest rental available, but it's actually a decent quality instrument. This retails for $900 from the music store. However, there's a markup. If you just bought it outright, it's more of a $600 instrument. Generally, for a beginner, you're looking to get something between 300 and maybe 1,000 would be considered student. Uh, some consider up to 1500 a student level instrument. So what you get for the money is a, an instrument that will hold its tune, um, that won't warp out of shape. Like if you get the cheap ones in the 100 to $200 range, you might be getting one that is not made of solid wood like the front and the back and the sides aren't solid wood, they're like um, a press board, composite kind of wood, and they suck. You might also see like a really shiny lacquer. In fact, um, <laughs> this one is lacquer. Lacquer affects the sound. You want a varnish that maybe has like a nice, like maybe a waxy shine to it or look on the description and see if it says it's a lacquer or if it's like an oil-based varnish because it will affect the quality of sound. So the cheap $100, $200 violins that are really bad, they'll be like really super shiny and what the violin people will tell you, and I learned this um, from somebody in a shop uh, a couple months ago is people will bring them in and say, I can't get it in tune, it won't stay in tune. And the reason is, is eventually, um, like sometimes the pegs are plastic, but eventually the instrument will actually warp and it will be impossible to tune it because the configuration has changed and it's just because it's not good quality. So if you're not sure if you wanna do violin, you could go for like a cheap, 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 cheap instrument, but at the same time, you might just feel frustrated that it won't work and stuff, and that would keep you from pursuing it. So I think it's good to get a slightly higher level instrument. Um, I think my favorite thing right now, after like trolling Amazon, looking at reviews, I basically found this place called Kennedy Violins in Vancouver. Um, 
Vancouver, Washington, and they have some really high quality violins, like especially some student models that are pretty awesome. And they're discounted because there's no middleman. And if you're not happy with it, if you get it shipped and you're not happy, you can send it back. Like you have options. Whereas if you get things off of Amazon, and you can get a Kennedy violins violin off of Amazon, but they're more expensive on Amazon, and if you just go direct to the website or call them up, you're paying like maybe 50 less dollars for a you know, three to four hundred dollar violin. So they have a really good like basic model and it's called, I believe, the Antonio G something Etude. Um, it might be like Giuliano, Giuliano. That one's in the about 250 range. It's, it's under 300. It sounds pretty good for what it is. Like you can watch on YouTube, hear these different violins, which was super helpful. And there's also um, a Ricard Brunel G2, which is pretty darn amazing for the money. That's a step up. And then the G1 has a better bridge. It's called the Aubert Bridge, spelled A-U-B-E-R-T. And it's just gonna create um, a better sound because it's higher quality wood. It's more detail taken with carving. And the G1 is the level up. The G1 versus the G2 has a better quality wood also. So you're getting various things and you can get it in a kit. So you have the case and the bow and everything like that. And that's the one I'm really considering buying. Okay, as I was saying, if you've ever worked with Kennedy Violins or you've ever called them and talked to them, uh, their customer service department, it's, it's just incredible. So, I mean, I have like brand loyalty to them and I don't even have a violin yet, but I'm definitely buying from them. They have a really fantastic warranty on all of their products. And if you're not happy, they will work with you to make sure that you're happy. The other super cool thing is, depending on the grade of violin you buy, they have a trade-up program. So if I was to get the Bunnell, which is the 350 uh, range of violin, if I ever want to trade up, like if I outgrow it in a year or two, I can get a 40% back off of the price towards a new Kennedy violin. And then if I go up to the Carpini, um, that's more of an investment that's going to be around at least 520. Like if I get the clearance model, which means there's some slight, um, you know, visual defects, nothing with the sound, but they have these discounts. So you could have like a slight blemish on it. Like maybe, maybe the varnish is like a little uneven or um, you look at the back and maybe there's like a slight variance in the wood grain pattern like if you care about that or, you know, there's just very, very subtle things that, that don't matter that much. And you could get, you know, maybe like $100 off of a violin. So it means you could go up in grade without setting your wallet further on fire. <laughs> so that's what I'm looking to do. They do have a lot of the different models that are in their clearance section. And if I do decide to get the Carpini and get the, the clearance one, that will put it around 522. And it also is like an upgrade in um, how much money I'll get back if and when I'm ready to trade up. So that would be like 80% back, which is nuts. And then if you go even higher to maybe like a $700 violin, um, you get 100% back. So that's like nuts. I don't even know how they do it, but they do. And I was talking to the best rep and he actually played some of the violins for me over the phone since I couldn't go in person. And it's 
really just to have such incredible customer service, like why would you want to buy from anyone else? It, I don't even know why you would. So go check them out, kennedyviolins.com, and call them up, talk to them, tell them what you're looking for. Uh, the website is really good. It actually tells you the character of the violin. Like me personally, I like the, the darker tones, like if you have a violin, you might be in like soprano range, like higher versus a lower kind of sound. Um, they describe it as bright where it's like la 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 la, like you might get like a, a march or you know, something very like energetic and, and crisp and like a sort of ringing clarity of tone versus dark where it's a little more like like broody and and rich and nuanced in like a more subdued way to, i i personally love the dark violin sound and you may not notice it like a whole lot if your ear is untrained but if you hear them side by side you can really kind of tell the difference um for instance if you go to their website and look up the Crackalure, which is um, a type of Carpini. It's just really bright versus the Carpini I'm looking at, which is uh, dark and more mellow and smooth. Then you can really hear the difference. And they have these videos up on uh, YouTube. So bright, dark, and the darker violins sound almost like a little more like violas, which is a lower register string instrument from violin. The other thing you can have is um, more more crisp, like enunciated kind of notes versus a more mellow and, and smooth kind of tone. So some people like that really crisp, kind of bright sounding uh, tone to their violin. I like the ones that are more mellow and smooth. And also if you're a beginner, the ones that are mellow and smooth are a bit more forgiving um, when you do mess ups. It's just some kind of nature of the violin. And so usually a beginner will be happier on darker sounding violins um, for that reason. And they, and they just sound good. Smooth is, there's like all these, all these different brackets and um, Alberto at the violin store was going through all the ranges and I'm messing up some of the words, but it's it's bright dark. You can have um, mellow versus, I think they say mellow versus open. Open is like when it's really projecting and carrying and to me that sounds a little bit more like in um, like vocals and singing it's more of a, a soprano type of voice versus you might get some altos that are more smooth and, and deeper like more resonant but the bright ones can be super resonant too so resonance is like when the strings vibrate and you can hear the thrum in the air and it just carries so yeah, every violin has its own character, even within the same models. Um, where the bridge is put can also affect the sound, as well as the type of strings that are used. They can affect the sound greatly. So basically, if you get a quality instrument, you can experiment with, experiment with different things, but make sure you like its initial sound fairly well so that you're not starting from, like for me, if I got a bright, open, more like enunciated sounding violin, I wouldn't really be as happy and I could, you know, try and finagle it with different strings or moving the bridge, but really I'm trying to alter the intrinsic character and voice of the violin. And it's just like with people, like you don't want to squash and crush that individuality, you just want to go for, um, what works for you so like for a person if they're like really talkative and you know running around and busy busy and you don't like that you're like a mellow person and that stuff wears you out well that's probably not the kind of people you want to be around and 
Likewise with violin, I mean, if you're practicing, you want to like the sound of your violin. And if you go to play it, and all you can hear is this like really caustic to you sounding sound, or maybe the mellow sounds, or the dark sounds too drab to you, and you just, you're like, where's that, that crispness and that brightness and that energy? Versus where's the moodiness? Where's that like, that rich chocolatey sound? You know, you're just gonna be happier if you pick the violin for the sound that you really do enjoy. And you'll wanna practice more. You won't be like, oh, and like, man, that's, that's so blah. So yeah, pick your people like you pick your violins, like you pick your people. And I hope this was helpful to everybody. This is like a brain dump of everything I've learned so far in about four days. So online research, lots of YouTube videos. Um, the first time I talked to somebody about violin where I heard about the you know, cheapo ones, that was actually a store called Music and Arts that was in Asheville, North Carolina. And I just happened to be in Hendersonville, walking down the street on Main Street, and my attention just went to the right, and there's a music store, and I just found myself going in. This is pre-piano, this is pre-anything, and I saw a lady there working on a violin, and I was like, ooh, she's so interested. And so I was talking to her, and she was telling me about how rentals are possible, and explaining what she was doing on the violin. Um, it took her a while to warm up and, and give me some real intel, but then she did, and I had this information, and it sat for a while. And then I come to find out where I'm at here in Georgia, there's multiple music and art stores, and they're the one that had the really good rental program. So it was like a summer special for like five bucks a month, and then after that it's like 22, so I'm like, I'm gonna do it. So yeah, that's this guy right here. It's really a, a pretty decent violin. I mean, the sound is good, and if I didn't just come off of listening to clips from Kennedy violins, I would buy this. I like the Ken Stanton one more, and it's cheaper at $350 versus this, they have a retail of nine on it. But you can use your, um, your rental credit towards it, so it's not like you're paying that much out of pocket, like some of your rental money is going to it. Um, Ken Stanton, for instance, though, they give a free lesson on an instrument above $100, so that's cool and really just very nice student violin. Very nice quality. Um, it wasn't overly lacquered and I'm telling you though, the, <laughs> the one I was listening to on Kennedy violins, they're just, they're just in another class. So I'm gonna hold out for those even though like my impulses make me wanna just get something right away definitely think it'll be worth listening to and I can give you an idea of a comparison when I get to hear the two that I'm like really between the two darker warmer ones and give you an idea of how they stack up at least over the phone.